Hello, uh, my name is Brett Elliker. I'm from the University of California, San Francisco. I'm one of the chest radiologists there, and I'm going to be talking to you today about radiography in the ICU as part of the STR online core curriculum. I have no disclosures, uh, so a few things I want to mention before we get into the meat of the lecture. One, this is a fundamental topic in chest radiology. If you go to a scientific meeting or a CME course, the majority of lectures are going to be on cross-sectional imaging of the chest, mainly CT and MRI. And there's actually very little education or formal training that we get in plain film interpretation after residency and fellowship. So in that sense, I think it's actually really important to present a topic like this. And while this may be a refresher for most people, uh, you may learn a few new things, you may get a couple tips and tricks, and at the very least, you get to see how other people do it. And I always find it really fascinating to see, uh, you know, how there's little differences, but in reality, we're probably all very similar in our approach to these things. Number two, everyone does things a little bit differently. So I'm going to present to you today how we do things generally at UCSF. You, other people at other institutions may do things a little bit differently, and, you know, that's okay. Uh, and so, you know, for instance... Uh, I may say, you know, you like the endotracheal tube tip three to seven centimeters above the carina. Someone may have slightly different numbers. So what you do is you take back all that information, you kind of synthesize it and, and incorporate, incorporate it into a way in your practice that makes sense. There is perhaps no more limited study in radiology than chest x-rays in the ICU. And it's so important to keep that in mind when interpreting these cases. So focus on the big picture, not the small details. What I'm going to do is I'm going to present you with a checklist of some things which I think are really important that you should look at on every case. So go through this little checklist of things to make sure you haven't missed any. So, as I said, no imaging study is more limited than the chest radiology uh, ICU film. It's limited by rotation, by level of inspiration, positioning of the patient, centering of the film, penetration, the amount of x-ray dose the patient gets, etc. Uh, so it's really important to focus on the big picture and perhaps one of the most important things to do right off the bat when you look at these films is to evaluate the lines and tubes. These are made radio opaque for a reason so that we can see them and a lot of what we do is saying, you know, what's the, is the position okay? Has the position changed? And what's happening from day to day? Aside from that, the goal of this uh, these imaging studies, since they are so limited, is to look for big and bad things, big complications. Not doesn't matter if the patient has a little bit more atelectasis at the right lung base than they did yesterday. What matters is, has they developed something that's going to really cause them uh, potential harm and needs to be intervened upon. So we're looking for significant complications, pneumothorax, mediastinal hematoma, foreign bodies, things like that. And one thing I'm not going to spend much time on today other than to mention it is I really think it's important to monitor long-term trends as opposed to subtle changes from day to day. I encourage everyone, instead of comparing to one day ago or two days ago, occasionally compare to a week ago or two weeks ago or however the patient, long the patient's been in the ICU and you actually can gain more insights about what's going on with the patient when you look at those long-term trends. Okay, so... Let's go down our checklist. Here's number one. So your eye is immediately drawn to the complete opacification of the left hemithorax, and you'll notice there is some degree of volume loss, so we're suspecting this is a case of com near complete left lung atelectasis. And of course, we have a good differential for that, which includes malignancies and mucus plugging, which is really common in the ICU, but that should lead us to the fact that the endotracheal tube is in the right main stem bronchus, which is causing the complete left lung collapse. So the first thing to look at on ICU cases is generally the lines and tubes. What's their position? Is the position appropriate? What is the change from day to day? And it's impossible to talk about all the lines and tubes and where they may be in this single short lecture. So I'm going to focus on a few of the most important ones and maybe perhaps some of the challenges interpretation. And let's start with the normal endotracheal tube. We like this about three to seven centimeters above the carina. Uh, that's sort of like Goldilocks, you know, the porridge isn't too hot or too cold. We don't like it too low or too high. If it's too low, it generally goes into the right main stem bronchus because that is more vertically oriented. It's the more of the natural continuation of the trachea, although I've, occasionally you see it in the left as well. And so ideally we like these above the carina 
and three centimeters above the carina is you know a, a, a good number. And at the other other side of the spectrum, we don't like these too high. This patient has an endotracheal tube balloon, which is in the level of the hypopharynx, and that's obviously way too high. That three centimeter number, the minimum number above the carina, comes from the fact that the tip can change quite a bit depending upon neck extension and flexion. And you can see in this case how there's two or two and a half centimeters of movement as the neck flexes. So if it's two centimeters above with extension, it potentially could, with neck flexion, extend into the right, into the right main stem bronchus and cause uh, left lung collapse. That's why that, that's where that three centimeters above the carina number comes from. The most concerning location of an endotracheal tube is perhaps this. You see the patient on the left is a classic example. And actually, this, is a, this case is advantaged by the fact that the patient is rotated. And we see the endotracheal tube in this location, whereas we see the tracheal air column that projects to the right of that, showing you that it is not within the tracheal air column. What else do we see? We see this column of air extending from the tip of the endotracheal tube down towards the abdomen. And that's air in the esophagus, because that's where the endotracheal tube is, is in the esophagus. We also see a very distended stomach and actually quite a bit of pneumoperitoneum. So this is a classic example of an esophageal intubation. Now, when the patient is not markedly rotated and the endotracheal tube is not very low, it may be difficult to distinguish is it in the trachea or the esophagus because those two structures will overlie one another on the frontal view of the chest. And the only clue, as seen in the patient on the right, is that the endotracheal tube tip might project below the level of the carina and it's not extend, not curving over to the left or the right. In other words, it's not in the left or right menstrum bronchus. It's below, sort of straight below. Okay, what about enteric tubes? This is the typical nasogastric tube we see here in the chest x-ray. So the nasogastric tubes, ideally, you want them in the stomach. You can see in the patient on the left, the tip of the nasogastric tube is actually in the stomach below the gastroesophageal junction. However, that proximal most side port is still in the lower esophagus. So we would like that proximal side port distal to the GE junction. This, so this should probably be advanced to some degree. The feeding tubes, well, I mean, our clinicians generally just like them in the stomach, but ideally we like the feeding tube tip, that weighted metallic tip of the Dobhoff tube to be distal or past the pylorus of the stomach. And we know it's in the duodenum here as it makes that inferior curvature into the second portion of the duodenum. <clears throat> okay, this is obviously not good. Uh, this is a nice example of an of a feeding tube whose in the tip is in the lung in the left lower lobe, and it follows the typical course of the airway. Uh, and this case was done overnight. This was not detected. The feeding tubes, the feedings were started, and the patient had a feeding, uh, you know, had a pneumonitis from being fed into the lung. So there is an abnormal location. Even more concerning is when it does this. Uh, and obviously this is in the airway and we see it extending into the left main stem bronchus, but then it makes this very sharp curve. And when you see that sharp curve, generally what that, is, that means is that it's perforated out into the pleural space. And what happens next is the clinicians run up there and rip this thing out because they're, they're really upset that it's in the pleural space. And now you develop a large bronchopleural fistula and the patients not infrequently develop a sizable pneumothorax very quickly. So it's important to tell your clinicians to get a chest tube kit ready to go in case the patient decompensates acutely. What about central lines? Well, this is also sort of like Goldilocks. You don't want them out too far. You don't want them in too centrally. Here is a typical venous landmarks overlying the chest x-ray with bilateral IJs and subclavians extending into the brachycephalic veins respectively and then coming together to form the superior vena cava. We would like central lines in general to be proximal or more central to the most proximal venous valves. And those most proximal venous valves occur approximately around the medial first rib contour. So just medial to that is where the proximal valves are located. We also like centrally to determine its location with regards to the cavoetra junction, which is approximately located at the level of the blue arrow. There's a lot of ways to determine that location, none of which are perfect by any means, but perhaps one of the easiest to remember and the most uh, consistent from case to case is you find the carina and you go two vertebral bodies below the carina. And that generally gives you about the location of the cave junction. So again, you don't want it too out far too distally, 
such as this patient on the left where it extends up the internal jugular vein and almost looks like someone was trying to put it at the level of the circle of Willis here. When it's out that far, uh, there's a much higher risk of, of thrombus uh, because it's in such a small vein. And then, of course, you don't want it too centrally. This patient on the right presented with arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias, because the tip of the PICC line was probably irritating the right ventricular myocardium protruding through the tricuspid valve. You don't actually see the tip here, but it's at least uh, very deep in the right atrium. One particular conundrum happens when the line extends down the left side of the mediastinum, and that's because sometimes this is okay, and sometimes it's really not okay. So here are several examples of, actually, these are all venous placements of, of, the, of various lines and other structures. Um, the patient on the far left has a pacemaker, and this is in, uh, you can see it extending down the left side of the mediastinum. People always wonder, could this be in the aorta? And what you see is in that inferior most arrow that it actually extends lateral to the left of the descending thoracic aortic contour, which extends, ex uh, essentially excludes an aortic placement. And then it crosses back over to the midline and the tip of at least one lead of the pacemaker is overlying the right atrium. So this is in a left superior vena cava, which is usually quite a large vein and is a perfectly adequate position for most ca venous catheters. Patient in the middle is a little bit more challenging because the, the tip of that catheter is very medial and certainly overlies uh, the descending thoracic aortic contour. This is in the internal mammary vein, uh, and it's a little bit challenging in this case to determine that. Sometimes you need a CT scan to prove uh, where the actual tip of the catheter is uh, to, just, uh, to, to make sure it's not an arterial placement. And then the patient on the far uh, right of the screen, we see it running down the left side of the mediastinum and then right around the the transverse arch, it makes this little quick curve, and that's in the approximate location of where we typically see what's called the aortic nipple on the chest x-ray, which is a little protrusion off the aorta, or at least it projects off the aorta, which is the location of the left superior intercostal vein. This is a really small vein, so this is not a great location, even though it's not arterial. Now, obviously, arterial location is always a possibility when it extends down the left side of the mediastinum. The blue arrow shows the location of the various central venous catheters or central lines or, or pacemakers or whatever as it extends over the upper lobe. And what you see in all of these cases is that it is, is, it's actually quite a low position. The subclavian vein is much more inferiorly located than the subclavian artery, at least it projects a lot lower. So that would just confirm that these are all in venous structures. Whereas arterial placements, we're gonna see the opposite of that. So this is a very typical arterial placement on the left side. We see the tip of that internal jugular catheter is very medially located. This was in the descending thoracic aorta. Same thing in the middle case, in the center of the screen, we see the tip overlying the descending thoracic aorta contour. Notice the location of the catheter that extends over the left lung apex. It's very, very high, much higher than the subclavian vein should be. So that's in the subclavian artery. And then the case on the far right, contrast the location of the AICD versus the PICC line. Notice the much more inferior location of the AICD, which is in the subclavian vein, compared to the PICC line, which is right up against the top of that lung apex, which is in the subclavian artery. So that's a nice contrast between the venous and the arterial placements. Okay, so number one in the checklist, lines and tubes. Look at lines and tubes on every single case. What about this case? So this patient's had a sternotomy, they have an endotracheal tube, a nasogastric tube, a pulmonary artery catheter, they have chest tubes, they have clips, they have some pulmonary edema, and it's very easy to miss through all of that noise, this structure. That is the radiopaque marker of a sponge. That's a sponge marker. So foreign bodies. I think radiologists are really excellent at subtracting out things that are overlying the patient, like EKG leads and big metal pads and things like that. And we're so good at it that sometimes we even subtract out things that aren't supposed to be there, foreign bodies that are in the patient. So that's a retained sponge. So number two, I, I always have to force myself in every post-operative case to look very carefully for these because these can be very subtle. I wanted to show you just one more sponge marker here in the patient on the far left side. That's a very typical, the ribbon-like sponge marker. And notice there's, there's often, this is in the plural space, and there's often this kind of reaction around it, which is partly some of the sponge and some plural fluid, et cetera.
So there's a sponge. Case in the middle was really challenging because again, there's a lot of things going on here. There's an internal jugular catheter, there's a chest tube, the patient's had a pneumonectomy, and they had an IJ line placed in the OR and they lost the guide wire of the IJ line that was in that superior vena cava through the right atrium into the inferior vena cava. And perhaps the, mo the most difficult one is the one on the far right hand side of the screen. And this is a retained surgical needle. These are really tough. That has a typical shape. It's curved, but they're varying in size. They can be quite small in some cases. And you can imagine if you turn that needle so it's facing you, it may be very difficult to appreciate. Uh, it doesn't have the typical shape in that case of the typical curved needle. Okay, so foreign bodies. Really force yourself to look for those because I think those are really easy to miss. Unknown case number three, patient two x-rays, both before and after internal jugular line removal. Patient developed some shortness of breath right after. The cl clinical team was concerned and they have this abnormality and they were all ready to put in a chest tube and they called down just to confirm. And what you notice in this case that it kind of looks like a pneumothorax, but if you continue that line inferiorly, it actually extends outside the chest. So this is just a fake out. This is something overlying the patient. This is not a pneumothorax. We should not put a chest tube. I didn't want to make it too easy. So I showed a mimic to start with instead of an actual pneumothorax. So here's, ah, there's a pneumothorax. Very typical pneumothorax. Notice that visceral pleural line that you see at the interface between the lung and the, and the, the pleural air. A pneumothorax must meet several criteria. I'll tell you, we see occasionally chest tubes put in for mimics, for skin folds and other artifacts that very closely mimic a pneumothorax, and we never want to do that. So a pneumothorax must meet several criteria. You must see a pleural line, and I'll show you, though there's one situation in which you will not see it, but in the majority of cases, you just can see the, the very thin visceral pleural layer sort of lined up exactly in the right obliquity, which demarks, demarcates the edge of the lung compared to the air in the pleural space. Obviously, there should be no vessels extending lateral to that line. This rule is occasionally broken when the pneumothorax may be loculated or is more anterior or posterior, and the lung in front or behind kind of comes around, but usually you have no vessels lateral to the line. And this seems obvious, but these things should not extend outside the rib cage or across the midline, uh, and sometimes people forget to look for that. Most common causes in the ICU are probably, number one is or two, is alvey rupture. This is due to barotrauma, non-compliant lungs, and, alve and the air dissects in the interstitium and can then perforate out the pleural space. This not uncommonly happens in patients who have ARDS, who have very non-compliant lungs and are in high positive pressure. Iatrogenic is another really big one, you know, after chest tube placement or whatever, um, very common cause of pneumothorax. Other things, things in the lung that can kind of rupture out, like a rupture bulla, or an infection that's cavitary and then ruptures out into the pleural space, or even a malignancy that, that kind of perforates out into the pleural space. So those are some of the more common causes of pneumothorax in the ICU. And again, just to reiterate this one more time, the, most, the, the, the feature we use to most commonly distinguish pneumothorax from fake outs, the most common, which is a skin fold, is do you see a line, that thin visceral pleural layer forming a line at the edge between the lung and the pleural space. You can see in this case, even though the lung is a little bit wider than the pleura, which is very dark because the lung is partly collapsed, we still see that very thin, delicate line at the interface between those two spaces. Whereas in the skin fold, all we see is white on one side, black on the other, no thin white line in between. Okay, so skin fold or pneumothorax in this patient. <clears throat> so you can see on the right side, the very typical thin white pleural line forming a pneumothorax. So that's a very classic pneumothorax. Whereas on the left side, white on one side, black on the other. No line in between. Those are just skin folds. Notice the most, the more inferior skin fold extends, starts to extend across the midline. All right, so this patient has both, both pneumothorax and skin folds. Now, of course, the one exception to this line versus edge concept is patients who have diffuse parenchymal lung disease, either collapse or consolidation. This patient has a horrible consolidation throughout their lungs and developed a left pneumothorax. And in this case, the lung is white, the pleura is black. We don't see a visceral line in between because it's completely obscured by the diffuse lung consolidation. So these are usually pretty, very obvious cases of pneumothorax. Okay, and let's show this case one more time. 
This looks like a line, except a pneumothorax must meet all three criteria, and this extends outside the chest wall. So despite the fact that it kind of looks like a, a line, uh, it is definitely not a pneumothorax because that's not conforming to the pleural space that we would expect. Okay, now, of course, pneumothoraces often layer to the most non-dependent portion of the chest, and in a patient who's upright or semi-upright, that's the lung apex, and then we often see that visceral pleural line the best there, so that's often the first place we look. However, in patients who are supine, fully supine, the most non-dependent portion of the pleural space is inferiorly and anteriorly, and sometimes all we see is not so much that line, but we see this lucency right at the diaphragm in the cosphernic angle, and that cosphernic angle extends very deep, the deep sulcus sign. Uh, in general, it's best to confirm this as a pneumothorax, because I don't think this has quite the same specificity as seeing that pleural line, but you should be aware of this, and, and, and it really suggests that the patient has an abnormal air, pleural air collection. Okay, so this patient had some sort of strange air collections, one at the base, one at the apex, and we were very concerned that there was pneumothoraces here, but the team didn't really believe us, so they wanted some confirmatory test, and we recommended they, they get a uh, decubitus view, left side down decubitus view to be sure. And I think a decubitus view is the, the, the type of examination that almost always confirms this with, you know, almost 100% of the time, it makes it very clear what's happening. You can see a very clear pneumothorax with the visceral pleural line in this case. Now, this patient not only has a big pneumothorax, but there is some mass effect pressing the heart and the other mediastinal structures in the trachea, deviating them to the right. So this is a tension pneumothorax. And I would just say tension pneumothorax is more of a clinical diagnosis than a radiographic diagnosis because occasionally we see some patients who have signs and symptoms of tension, who don't necessarily have radiographic signs of tension, and vice versa. Now, that being said, I'm sure this patient has a tension pneumothorax, but just remember that this is more of a clinical than a radiographic diagnosis. Okay, so lines and tubes, foreign bodies, and then starting into the big complications, such as a pneumothorax. What other complications do we want to look for? This patient has diffuse lung consolidation. They have ARDS. They were on a lot of positive pressure, so we know pneumothorax is a potential complication from uh, alveolar rupture, barotrauma. We saw these lucent air collections in the sub-Q tissue, which drew your attention, our attention to these vertically oriented linear lucencies that paralleled the mediastinum. And this is a nice example of pneumomediastinum. And again, the majority of these cases are due to alveolar rupture. What are the features of pneumomediastinum? Most commonly, vertically oriented linear lucencies paralleling the mediastinal borders, often seen best in the neck, but extending down into the mediastinum. Number two, things in the mediastinum may be outlined by air, and those include vessels like aorta and pulmonary arteries, and it also includes the airways, either the trachea or the bronchus, and sometimes you can see both sides of the wall of the trachea or the bronchus, which is usually an abnormal. You can also see the air extending across the midline and forming a single contiguous, continuous diaphragm. That's another sign of pneumomediastinum. Most common causes, again, just like pneumothorax, alveolar rupture is probably the most common cause. And this occurs in three groups of patients. Patients who are, are, have non-compliant lungs because of ARDS or interstitial lung disease where it takes a lot of positive pressure to ventilate them, or patients who have airways disease like asthma, and bronchitis obliterans. Other potential sources of, the, of air are the airway itself. So if you had some sort of injury to the airway or trauma to the airway, air can leak out from the airway into the mediastinum. You can have air, there's some air in your esophagus. So if you have an esophageal rupture, you could potentially get pneumomediastinum. The majority of cases of esophageal rupture have a little amount of pneumomediastinum, but not very much. Not enough that you typically see it on a chest radiograph. Uh, the exceptions often are if the patient's having an endoscopy procedure where they're actually trying to distend the esophagus with air and then they cause a rupture, they can start to pump air into the mediastinum. And remember, the mediastinum is a, a highway between the neck and the abdomen. So if you have a perforated viscous in the abdomen, that air can extend up. If you have a sinus fracture in the neck, that air can extend down. And here are three examples of the pneumomediastinum showing all the typical features. This case on the far left, we first see it in the neck just because there's good contrast between the air and the soft tissues of the neck. 
And then we see that extending down to the mediastinum. There's not as good contrast here just because the air in the mediastinum is next to the air in the lungs. However, we still can appreciate it here. Case in the middle, we see air outlining structures, such as the aorta, the sort of ringed with air. We also see both sides of the tracheal wall because there's air in the tracheal lumen and also within the mediastinum adjacent to the trachea. And then in the lateral view in this patient, we see also vessels outlined by air. We see vessels outlining the pulmonary arteries. We see vessels outlining the transverse portion of the aortic arch. So those are nice examples of pneumomediastinum. Okay. Now, that being said, you know, the majority of cases of pneumomediastinum are treated conservatively. You want to know about it, you want to treat the underlying condition which caused pneumomediastinum, but it's rare to have to treat pneumomediastinum itself. Uh, so it's on the checklist, but it's perhaps not the number one most concerning thing on the checklist. All right, what about this case? Case number five. This is perhaps the most commonly missed abnormality in the ICU. Uh, and we see this thing down here that's too white, this opacity. And people often misinterpret this as an elevated hemidiaphragm. But of course, when you have an elevated hemidiaphragm, the peak of the diaphragm is in the normal spot, it's just too high, whereas the peak here is at the, at the mediastinum, right here is the peak. And this is a patient from, this is 20 minutes before, same patient, and you notice there's a striking change. So this is an example of combined right middle and lower lobe collapse from a mucus plugging in the bronchus intermedius. Lobar collapse is really commonly missed in the ICU. I think this is one of the areas where radiologists are actually quite good at it and clinicians are not as good at it. So we can really add some additional information when we see collapse that, that maybe clinicians might not. Always is a question, is this atelectasis or some alveolar filling process? And the main distinguishing feature between those two is atelectasis, the alveoli are airless. So we expect signs of volume loss, whereas with alveolar disease, the alveolar are filled with something, fluid or hemorrhage or inflammatory infiltrates, whereas we don't expect signs of volume loss. This is a patient with complete left lung collapse, and we see the trachea shifted over, the mediastinum shifted over, the heart's pulled over, and the diaphragm's elevated. Now, in many cases, we don't see any of these signs of volume loss, and perhaps the most accurate way to distinguish atelectasis from alveolar disease in the x-ray is when you see the fissure is pulled towards the thing that's too white, right? So here are two examples of right upper lobe opacities. Right upper lobe collapse, the minor fissure, which we tend to see quite well in the frontal x-ray, is deviated upwards towards the collapsed lung because the alveoli are airless. Whereas in the pneumonia, where the alveoli are filled with neutrophils and other inflammatory cells, the minor fissure is in the normal location because there is no volume loss. So I think the fissure is perhaps the most helpful. The problem being that the major fissure is not well seen on a frontal x-ray because it runs obliquely to the plane of the imaging. So here's a right lower lobe process and we don't have any signs of volume loss and we can't see where the fissure is very well. So we just can't tell and we have to give a differential, say this could be atelectasis or pneumonia or aspiration. So these are tough cases, but again, atelectasis is one of those things that, that I think radiologists do a really good job at detecting, so be very, um, uh, be very aware of that. What else? Well, last topic is this. This patient has diffuse lung consolidation with air bronchorups. There's no question that this is some kind of alveolar filling process, and obviously in the acute setting, we think of several things in the differential of diffuse consolidation. Good old-fashioned cardiogenic pulmonary edema, uh, acute lung injury, or ARDS, or diffuse alveolar damage. We're going to talk in a minute about the differences between those terms. Uh, pneumonia, and when it's diffuse like this, we commonly think of uh, viral infections. We think of atypical bacterial infections like mycoplasma, and in the appropriate clinical setting, we can consider pneumocystis. And then if the patient is hemoptysis, we can consider pulmonary hemorrhage. And this is an example of acute lung injury in a patient who has idiopathic ARDS, or Hammond-Rich syndrome, or acute interstitial pneumonia, all of which mean basically the same thing. Now, one caveat is it is very difficult to distinguish large layering pleural fusions from diffuse lung consolidation. This is a case where we knew they had pleural fusions, but we were also very concerned they had a lot of lung consolidation. So we thought this was an example of bad pulmonary edema, probably alveolar edema in the supine patient. And then they did an upright x-ray and it was almost all pleural effusion that was just layering up. So when the patient's supine, it's really difficult to make this distinction. When this patient basically had no significant parenchymal consolidation. So again, it's back to remember the limitations of these studies. Okay, that's pleural effusions.
Now, as I said, this is a patient with acute lung injury. And so one last thing I wanted to mention is the differences between three terms, diffuse alveolar damage, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and acute lung injury, because they all mean similar things, although there are important differences between these three terms. Diffuse alveolar damage is something a pathologist sees, and it has certain characteristics like hyaline membranes and edema and eventually going over to fibroplasia over time, but this is really a histopathologic pattern of injury. Acute respiratory distress syndrome is a clinical disorder that has a strict definition that's characterized by four things. Acute symptoms, diffuse opacities on imaging, exclusion of cardiogenic edema as a cause of those diffuse opacities, and a reduced PaO2 to FiO2 ratio. Whereas acute lung injury is simply the clinical syndrome associated with anyone who has diffuse alveolar damage on pathology. Now when I look at an image, I often don't know what the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio is, and I often don't know if they have excluded cardiogenic edema as a cause. So there are things that I don't know that go into the definition of ARDS. So I generally will say acute lung injury when I'm talking about a differential diagnosis on a chest X-ray um, uh, as opposed to ARDS. Okay, so now we've gone through the full checklist. Lines and tubes, foreign bodies, pneumothorax, pneumomestinum, atelectasis, acute alveolar processes, one of which is acute lung injury, a very common one in the ICU. And of course, this list, you could extend this list and make it much longer, but these are some of perhaps what I consider the most important things to look for on the ICU radiograph. So, in summary, remember that checklist. I think if you don't remember anything else, remember foreign bodies because I think that's, the, that's one of the more common things for radiologists to, to miss because some of them are shockingly subtle. But go through a short checklist of your own you may use this one or you can develop your own and just make sure that you assess for these abnormalities on every ICU chest radiograph. Remember how, in, how limited these studies are and it's all about the big picture. Look at big changes over time. The goal of, Our goal is to monitor the lines and tubes, look for big complications and look at the long-term trends. So go back and look a week or two weeks and see what's happening over that long period of time. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking about this topic and hopefully this was helpful.